Thank you so much, Rebecca. And um, it is a joy to be with you, as I said earlier. And I consider you friends. Uh, some of you I've known for quite a while, and we share the same Jesus and the same mission. Uh, and others of you I've met for the first time, and it has been an absolute delight. So thank you for your kindness and your friendship. Uh, I've just had a wonderful time. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, the City Network leaders, uh, this has been a special weekend for my bride, Liz, and I. We celebrated our 37th anniversary, so that's pretty sweet. Thank you. So would you join me in prayer before I share some of the thoughts that God has put in my heart and mind? Lord Jesus, we ask that you'd be glorified. Um, Holy Spirit, do your work uniquely in each one of our lives and our context. Bring us encouragement, bring us challenge. Um, and uh, we'd ask, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts would be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer, our audience of one. In Jesus' name, amen. So if I were to ask you, um, what is the greatest threat facing pastors across our nation today, what would come into your mind? I mean, I suggest several things. I don't know exactly what you're thinking, but perhaps uh, I hear often the challenge of doctrinal drift, uh, cultural accommodation. Sometimes I hear pastors cry about overwork or inadequate resources or relational conflict with their leadership boards. But I want to suggest for your consideration today that perhaps there is a less visible, more insidious peril, a silent killer that is incredibly perilous to the pastors of our nation. I was reminded of this just a couple of weeks ago when I had the wonderful joy, and it was the joy of meeting for the first time a young pastor named Dave who lives near Kansas City. Uh, one of his leaders, who knew have made to flourish, his congregational leader, is a wonderful leader in Kansas City, a business leader, said, you got to meet with Tom. <laughs> so I don't know what he was expecting, but we uh, had our favorite spot at the uh, Starbucks. I met Dave, shook his hand. Uh, what a delightful conversation, his warmth. Uh, he was open and transparent. And right away, you know, when you're with someone, I just thought, this guy loves Jesus, and he's a great guy. And I was having such a wonderful time in conversation and listening. We share our stories. And then Dave said something to me that I wasn't ready for. He looked me in the eye. And I, you know, it was the first time I met this guy. And somehow he felt safe, which I'm grateful for, and vulnerable, which is essential. And he said to me, Tom, he said, I'm going to die without community. His vulnerability, his loneliness, his transparency grabbed me and shook me to the core. Because Dave is like so many pastors I encounter around the country. In one sense, Dave is doing really, really well. <laughs> right? This guy is amazingly gifted for pastoral service. I mean, he fits it like a glove. He doesn't have some disqualifying sin hiding in his moral closet. He has a good marriage. He's an involved dad. His church is actually growing and his budget's healthy. Amen on that one. Dave would seem to be on the outside the poster pastor for Made to Flourish. But Dave is like so many of his peers. He is facing this incredible threat to his well-being and his longevity as a pastor. I want to suggest to you it is perhaps the most insidious and perilous threat to his life. What is this peril? It is the peril of pastoral isolation. Dave's weekly schedule, like most pastors, is crammed full of people. There are people all around him, and his visible Sunday role surrounds him with people, and ironically, Dave is perilously isolated and deeply alone. Loneliness stalks him the moment he wakes up and when he closes his eyes and puts his head on his pillow. What is encouraging is Dave knows this. He is self-aware. He knows it needs to change. That was his cry to me as a young pastor. But the question remains, what does he do about it? Where does he go? 
who does he seek out? As we sat there having coffee, it was bold and black and powerful, filled with caffeine. One of the encouraging things for me now versus three and a half years ago is I was now able to point him to Made to Flourish. Its website, our broader Kansas City pastoral network as at least one important step. But as I left my time with Dave, I could not get out of my mind and heart. It haunted me on the way home. There are so many Daves out there across the nation. And how very much is on the line with that reality regarding their own lives, their families, their marriages, and the important calling they have in the world. And it is an important calling. Pastoral isolation is, in my view, increasingly one of the greatest threats pastors face and the church faces. It is a toxic seedbed. I don't know how else to say it. For burnout, scandalous behavior, damaging to pastors, of course, to their families, their marriages, their children, their congregations, and the collective witness of the church in the community and the world. Now, let's unpack this just a little bit. According to Barna's work, 2017 State of Pastors, 52% of pastors say they have felt incredibly lonely or isolated from others just in the past three months. Among pastors who are at low risk of burnout, 74% report they have uniquely excellent friends that are close to them, that they are safe with. Now we all hear, with the media amplification, prominent evangelicals and pastors who are forced to resign over important and egregious and comp compromising behavior. Almost daily, isn't it true, the media reveals new cases of clergy sexual abuse, and now it's scandalous in amazing proportions in the Catholic Church. So is it any wonder we are seeing fewer seminary applications, a dwindling, dwindling pastoral pipeline that should concern all of us because of church's plan A and God's redemption, and a chilling cultural headwind, increasingly skeptical of pastoral value and pastoral integrity and credibility. In this wonderful new issue of Common Good, I commend a made to flourish pastor and wonderful leader in Nashville, Scott Sauls. He has written a very insightful article. I encourage you to read it carefully. Let me highlight just a little bit of his brilliant assessment as a pastor. Scott points out Gallup's poll of a recent evaluation of American clergy as a whole. And he says 37% view the clergy as honest or even ethical. Let that sink in. Our profession once topped in the 95% range of all Americans, whether they're believers, atheists, or not. And now we have fallen, and I won't list the other professions because I love those professions, but we are behind. So what's going on? Why the lowering of the tide of clergy credibility? Scott points, I think, to one of the main realities, and that is what he calls celebrity status. So many pastors across the nation have scores of fans, but very few friends. who are so removed from accountability and local community. Scott summarizes this clergy pastoral leadership implosion. It's what it is. With three bottom line words. They became isolated. They became isolated. One of my good friends and colleagues and mentors in many ways is Donald Guthrie, professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. 
He and his research team have done the best, most comprehensive work on pastoral wholeness and well-being in our nation and resilience. In his wonderful writings and books, he points out to several factors, and I'm not, I do not want to be reductionistic, but I want you to see what he says. At the heart of it, he says right away, he points to this reality. Pastoral isolation is the main concern we have. In other words, he understands what we all need to understand, that isolation spells ruin. Guthrie writes, we are saying that it's easy for pastors, fearing what people might think, to become isolated from others. And by so doing, they fail to grow spiritually. As one pastor puts it, Dr. Guthrie says, I have a longing to be shepherded by someone else. But a fear to actually ask someone into my life. That's the heart of pastors of America right now. Against the themes that we are woven together in community, Dr. Guthrie hits it. He says this, quote, isolation is incredibly bad for self-care and a recipe for poor leadership as well. And the question for all of us here today is what can be done about it? Now I wanna suggest that Made to Flourish is uniquely positioned in God's sovereignty by the Holy Spirit to make a strategic difference. As we build out a national network where not only ideas matter, and they do, where not only practices matter, they do, but incredibly important relationships incarnationally matter. Because the theory of change undergirding our Made to Flourish mission is that flourishing pastors lead to flourishing congregations that lead to flourishing communities. This is our change theory. It is backed by profound biblical theology, strong sociology, and important philosophy. It is sound. Flourishing pastors are at the headwaters of change that we all seek. But for pastors to continue to flourish over the long haul, pastors must move from the gravitational pull of relational and institutional isolation to greater relational connectedness. At Made to Flourish, we seek to narrow, as you know, most of you, the perilous Sunday to Monday gap. This gap between Sunday work and worship, where pastors are focused more how well they do on Sunday than how their congregation is doing on Monday. We are committed to narrow that gap, this whole life discipleship gap. Many pastors deeply fail to equip their congregations for Monday life, and we are passionate about narrowing that. Our Made to Flourish national team, our city network leaders are working hard to provide excellent resources, relationships, community to help pastors narrow this gap. And we are encouraged by the initial progress we are making, but we are also finding now three and a half years in, that there is another gap we must pay closer attention to. It is one of our greatest threats. It is pastoral resiliency gap. And at the heart of this resilience is a relational gap, a perilous gap where many pastors are experiencing between life-giving relational connection and life-draining isolation. Because God created us in his relational image for himself and to have relationships with others. The attentive care and freedom to embrace each other in our hearts is essential for human flourishing, for pastoral flourishing. We simply cannot thrive without relational connection. And pastors are not only shepherds, they are sheep too. They are sheep too. Greater relational connection and closer community must be nurtured if pastors and their leadership are to thrive in the world. If they are to be resilient and increasingly Christ-like for the long haul of their work. So my thesis this morning is this. Pastors who flourish have two characteristics fundamentally. They live before an audience of one, but they serve among a community of many. Now, when we look at the New Testament, 
we get a powerful glimpse, don't we, of flourishing and resilient pastoral leadership. A closer look, for example, at the text of the Holy Scripture paints a compelling picture, both in terms of the essential importance of nurturing intimacy with Jesus, as well as forming new relational connection with others in community. The Apostle Paul brilliantly models this. I'd like to unpack a little bit for us this morning. As Paul nears the end of his life and ministry, he writes to Timothy, his younger protege in the faith and friend in the faith, some very brilliant and hope-filled words. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, we read a very profound framework the Apostle Paul gives us, and we often miss its profundity. Paul writes, as he faced martyrdom in Rome, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I want you to notice that Paul links three metaphors together. A military one, an athletic one, and a banking one. And he gives us crucial insight into his flourishing life and resilient leadership. Paul knew, fundamentally, the Christian life was a battleground, not a playground. And as he enters the last part of his marathon life, he says, I fought the good fight. But notice also, Paul knew that the Christian life was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. He says, I finished the race. What an amazing statement. Paul knew also that the Christian life was a sacred trust. It was not something he could ever squander. He says, I have kept the faith as he crosses the finish line. For many years, transparently, and this is true, I think, for all of us, right? We, we read the text through our cultural lens. And I had a very individualistic cultural lens. I'm like, hey, Paul, you did it. Paul's flourishing resiliency in pastoral ministry was not, however, in context of the text, in the first century context, it wasn't just a courageous individual pursuit. It was that, of course. But what I missed for many years is it flowed out of a deepening intimacy with Jesus and a life-giving, nurturing community of close and intimate friends. Like my pastor Dave friend that I got to know at Starbucks, Paul knew he needed community to flourish. It was essential. It wasn't optional. And to finish well, he needed it as well. Paul didn't finish well alone. And neither can you or can I or any pastor across our nation. So often isn't it true, and maybe it's just my own demented imagination or framework, we often imagine Paul as this hard-charging, self-assured apostle on gospel mission. Right? And he was, of course, that. But a closer look at the biblical text shows us that he was deeply relationally connected with others. When you read the pages of the New Testament written by Paul or describing Paul, there is no leadership island here. There's not even a small hint of pastoral isolation. But rather the intentional, yes intentional, continuous, joyful nurturing of the deepest friendships of safety and vulnerability and collaboration and community in the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just give you an appetizer where we see it. You ready? Here's a little snapshot. In the book of Acts, for example, chapter 20, Dr. Luke presents seven of Paul's closest traveling companions. And he lists their names. I'm so grateful for that. Their names, Sopater, Pyrrhus, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychicus, Trophimus. No pastoral isolation here. Not a hint of it. Later on in Acts chapter 20, Luke showcases with the most brilliant Greek literary flair. It is as if Luke is amazed as a front row witness of Paul's deep relational love and connection to the Ephesian leadership of the church. And the description of deep affection, you notice the language? And tears, as Paul says goodbye, reflects the deep connection he had with the whole church leadership. 
in Paul's final greeting, and I encourage you to look at all his epistles, you just see it all over, but in Paul's final greeting in 2 Timothy chapter 4, notice Paul lists nine individuals. I encourage you to look at it. Prisca, Aquila, Onesiphorus, Erastus, Trophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia. No pastoral isolation there. And that final greeting Paul gives to Timothy, isn't it amazing he says to Timothy, do your best to come to me before winter. Even an imprisoned Paul is not isolated. But he's so deeply connected to others. Many years ago, I heard a proverb that I love, and it says something like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This was pastoral leadership in the first century. It is difficult, of course, and it can feel lonely, but it's neither an impossible calling nor is it a solitary enterprise. In his outstanding book on pastoral leadership, one of the finest ever written, in my opinion, Henry Nouwen, it's called In the Name of Jesus, speaks with timeless truth for us. He says, when Jesus speaks about shepherding, he does not want us to think about a brave, lonely shepherd who takes care of a large flock of obedient sheep. In many ways, he makes it clear that the ministry is a communal and mutual experience. And now in writes, I have found over and over again how hard it is to be truly faithful to Jesus when I am alone. Eugene Peterson, who just went to be with the Lord, had such brilliant wisdom, and he reminds us that we are stories, but we are never stories alone. Pastors and Christian leaders who flourish over the long haul live before an audience of one, yet they serve in a community of many. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the flourishing and resiliency of our own Christian lives? You may be a pastor, you may be not here this morning. You are in danger like I am in whatever you're calling if you are deeply isolated and alone. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? And my hunch is that a lack of relational connectedness, I hear this among executives and business leaders in their own profession, is a deep, perilous isolation that needs attention, perhaps in your life. But what this this resiliency gap fueled by isolation mean for Made to Flourish? What does it mean as we seek to empower pastors to integrate faith, work, and economic wisdom for the flourishing of their communities? What does it mean? And I want to suggest to you this morning, in addition to the nurturing of their own intimacy with Jesus, there are three relational connections that must be nourished for pastoral health, resiliency, and flourishing for the long haul. Three of them. And we must be committed to nurture and provide pathways and opportunities to encourage pastors in these three relationships. Here they are. First, a pastor's relationship with congregational members is essential. Secondly, pastoral relationship with other pastoral older mentors is essential. And third, pastoral friends and pastoral peers are also essential. Let me unpack a little of that for us this morning. First, we must encourage closer relationships with congregants. Often pastors are isolated from their congregation. For pastors whose main paid job is serving in a local church, it is all too easy to find us on an island of vocational isolation. Vocational isolation. This was true transparently in the early years of my pastoral work. That is, until I began to make workplace visits a regular part of my pastoral practice. And what I discovered was that I had known so little of my congregation, their lives, what their struggles were. We often talked about the latest sports update and just a sliver of their life. But when I began to engage them in their workplace, transformation took place in my life. My relationships with congregations took a deeper dive. My sense of community grew, and one of the most important things for a pastor is I now took on the role of a learner rather than a teacher. I became a fellow sheep rather than a shepherd. A couple of weeks ago, I joined one of my 
pastoral or one of my parishioners on a workplace visit. His name is Matt. He is a CEO of a very large hospital context in Kansas City. I have to tell you, during those three hours of shadowing Matt, I've known Matt and his family for a couple years at some level, but I really didn't know Matt. Three hours of shadowing him in his workplace, his meetings, the challenges, the conversations have done more for me and understanding more his world and knit our hearts more together than any other context. And not only that, as we have grown together, but growing closer to Matt in community is an essential part of me in growing closer to Christ. There are many ways pastors can avoid isolation. Many ways they can nurture closer friendships with their congregants. But one of the most transformational pastoral practices is regular workplace visits. It is profoundly transformational. This is why Made to Flourish, we encourage this. We coach this. We train this among our pastors. I know a few practical things that are more transformational than workplace visits. If we can get pastors and congregants to do that, we are way ahead of the game. What workplace visits do is they push back the peril of pastoral vocational isolation. And they open door to life-giving community that that pastor needs, not just the parishioner. And if you are not a pastor, do you see your pastor as a fellow human being fallen, struggling, in need of friendship and community? We often hear about take your child to work day, and that's a good thing, but have you thought about take your pastor to work day? <laughs> How transformational that would be in a congregation. As pastors in our network, we are committed to encourage pastors first to nurture a closer relationship with congregants and not be isolated. Secondly, we must encourage relationships with pastoral mentors. Today in the marketplace, having an older mentor or mentors is increasingly seen as more than a nice option. It is seen as an essential leadership development component. But in the church, in most churches, intentional cross-generational pastoral mentoring is the rare exception rather than the norm. And one of the most glaring forms of pastoral isolation is generational isolation. Today it's common, isn't it, to sociologically and demographically stratify generations into the boomers, millennials, Gen Zs, and all that. Now there is analytical value in that, in that stratification. But there's also potential unintended shadowy side to it that explicitly or implicitly reinforces generational suspicion and builds walls of isolation between generations rather than bridges. We dare not forget that like all Christians, pastors face the real and often, often unrelenting assault of the evil one. One of the evil one's greatest strategies is to isolate followers of Jesus from one another. I remember watching a National Geographic special. You've probably seen things like that. There's this pride of lions, these African lions, and you know the strategy, right? They seek to isolate one wildebeest or gazelle from the rest of the herd. And particularly, they look for the younger, vulnerable ones. And once isolated from the herd, it's only a matter of time until the lions have their scrumptious dinner. Isolation is perilous. Generational isolation is deadly. C.S. Lewis, in all his brilliance, spoke about this, didn't he? In his remarkable book, The Screwtape Letters, where this senior devil trains his young apprentice, Wormwood, Lewis knocks it out of the park. He writes through the lens of this demonic apprenticeship. And since we cannot deceive the whole human race all the time, it's important that to cut every generation off from all others. For where learning makes a, flea, a free commerce between the ages, there's always the danger that the characteristic heirs 
of one may be corrected by the characteristic truths of another. Intergenerational mentoring is not something that just happens on its own. Rather, a certain degree of intentionality must grab the hearts of both the older generation of pastors as well as the younger generation of pastors to make time for it, to make space for friendships to deepen and meaningful interactions to occur. Many years ago when I was a parachurch leader in Dallas and going to seminary, a great generation business leader took me under his wing. He invited me into his life. I still remember those conversations at breakfast, and he encouraged my development. Our Made to Flourish gatherings, learning communities, and city networks promote different generations of pastoral leadership to interact with each other on both a personal and strategic, strategic level. I continue to grow my enthusiasm for Made to Flourish's deepening partnership with Leadership Network. For example, Leadership Network, as you heard Ron earlier, encourages and works strategically with the largest churches in America in attendance. And not long ago, I had the privilege to play a mentoring role with a group of young Leadership Network pastors in San Diego. What a time it was together. And we wove together not only strong faith, work, and economic wisdom, excuse me, but also the importance of pastoral leadership over the long haul. This kind of cross-generational pastoring and mentoring is absolutely essential for the flourishing of our pastor. The third relationship is this. It is pastoral peers. Particularly needed now are pastoral peers outside of one's ecclesial tribe. There is an impoverished pastoral isolation that occurs when a pastor has little contact with any pastors outside his or her tribe or his or her ethnicity or cultural context. Our made, our made to Flourish networks, as well as learning communities, provide a crucially needed safe space for beautiful and enriching, generous orthodoxy blended with ethnic, gender, and ecclesial diversity. It is one of the most beautiful things that the Spirit of God is doing in Made to Flourish. In a time such as ours, where there's so much political partisanship, Polarization threatens to isolate pastors in their tribal echoing chambers. And Made to Flourish is uniquely, by God's sovereignty, positioned to build, build bridges of trust and collaboration. Pastors from differing backgrounds are locking arms together around the nation, around whole life discipleship and gospel mission that speaks into every nook and cranny of life. A gospel that transforms not only individual hearts, but addresses social injustices, works for the flourishing of communities, and seeks the common good. A couple of uh, months ago, I had the great joy of being in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a great city. And uh, one of our Made to Flourish board members, Lisa Slayton, had graciously invited me to be a part of Jubilee Professional. Along with that conference, I was able to speak to a group of pastors in Pittsburgh gathered by our Made to Flourish leadership team there. And our, uh, excuse me, our Made to Flourish leaders in Pittsburgh are awesome. They are seasoned pastors who I love. Terry Tim and Jace Logan. And I remember the breakfast, what I remember most about that breakfast was not what I said, it's what Jace Locum said. Imagine a group of pastors being introduced to Made to Flourish and Jay said in his own brilliant way how impactful Made to Flourish had been on his life. He is a part of a wonderful ecclesial tradition. But Jay put it this way about his Made to Flourish network transformation. Here's what he said. He said, I found my people. What was Jay saying? What was he saying? God had used Made to Flourish to move him away from a perilous isolation called, called ecclesial isolation to a greater pastoral community and collaboration for the city of Pittsburgh and beyond, and his life is enriched by it. For pastoral resiliency gap to be narrowed, and it must be narrowed, it's one of our greatest threats. For pastors to flourish and to finish well, 
Pastors must not be isolated. They must nurture close relationships with congregational members, pastoral mentor, mentors, and pastoral friends, and pastoral peers. So at Made to Flourish, we are committed to nourish these, to provide resources, learning communities, and opportunities for all three of these relational stratifications to be nurtured intentionally in their life. Imagine what that could do. And we are committed on the front end to train a new generation of flourishing and resilient pastors whose paradigm and practice of the pastoral calling reject at its beginning pastoral isolation and nurture deep relationships and close community. We are training a new generation of pastors through our Made to Flourish pastoral residencies. Presently, we have 13 of them around the country, and we are hopeful to add more. That's when local churches in our network become like teaching hospitals. Just like a physician goes to medical school and then spends time doing the work in residency, learning what it means to be a physician, pastors need the same reality. And our current model is not getting it done. But we can make a difference. After seminary, they spend in a residency and immersive time in a local church that's healthy with a strong faith at work and economic wisdom culture or hold life discipleship matters. The structure of the residency is model a pastoral paradigm where pastoral isolation is a foreign concept. Rather, they are immersed in a community right away in their pastoral journey of life-giving relational connection and mentoring on all three of those levels. Imagine the rich experience that is. The young pastor forms first close relationships with congregational men members who mentor them. They form past relationships with seasoned pastors who mentor them. And the young pastor also forms close peer-to-peer -peer relationships with other pastoral residents and staff who are going through the journey with them. I have never seen anything more transformational in my years as a pastor. A pastoral residency experience puts the young pastor on a path to flourishing wholeness and resiliency. Our young pastors deserve that kind of trajectory or we are setting them up for failure. At Christ Community, which is the precious I'm a tear, so you've heard me before. So. But at Christ Community, the local church I've been privileged to serve, we have been doing a pastoral residency for about 15 years now. And I can't begin to tell you how transformational it is in the life of the church, the life of the older pastors, and the young pastors. I long for the day when more and more churches across the our nation embrace this idea and become teaching hospitals that train another generation of pastors differently. The impact of this training and the future leadership of the church would be staggering. Made to Flourish is committed to be a catalyst to move this forward in our nation. Many pastors today are facing the grave peril of isolation, no question. Yet Made to Flourish is uniquely positioned, I believe, to provide accessible pathways and structures and encouragements that move people from isolation to connectedness to flourishing resiliency. Four years ago, as we were launching and conceiving Made to Flourish, one of my dear friends, younger friend, pastoral friend who has a national speaking platform, and he honors it well, came into Kansas City and we had a conversation. And I asked him, what's your wisdom as we start this? And I'll never forget what he said. He said to me, Tom, narrowing the Sunday to Monday gap to equip the congregations of America for where they're called to be the majority of their life is huge. It's huge. We have got to do this. But he said, I think when the story is told about made to flourish, the greatest thing <laughs> any pause like that that will be said for God's glory, the greatest thing that Made to Flourish will ever accomplish is for pastors to have greater wholeness. I think he's right. 
I think he's on to something. The need is great. Let me wrap it up. The need is great. There is much on the line, friends. Those of you who care about the kingdom, about Christ and the church. But there is an amazing door of opportunity before us. So will we respond? Will we pray? Will we join hands? Will we fervently get involved with Made to Flourish? And will you honestly, prayerfully, dependently lock arms with Made to Flourish on this mission? Will you support us and get involved? For such a time as this, I believe God has raised up Made to Flourish because pastors matter. The local church matters. And flourishing pastors are crucial to the mission of God in the world. It is flourishing pastors who lead flourishing congregations, who shape flourishing communities. So let us, with renewed vigor, creativity, intentionality, generosity, let us join together in a Godward dependence with prayerful commitment to foster a growing national network of pastors who are flourishing and who are resilient over the long haul. Amen? And amen.